you, can we get to those bunkers, and what's happening with the metal on the hull and the internal portions of the ship. And so that's what we're trying to do, is find out, is there a way that we can contain that oil? Today, the oil has begun to leak from more places than ever. To understand the extent of the threat to Pearl Harbor, the Park Service is conducting a detailed survey of the Arizona. Dan Lenehan is a Park Service diver and archaeologist. If it's all released at once, it will probably be a major problem. For the Park Service, the challenge is to avert a final catastrophe, an oil spill in the middle of Pearl Harbor. There's no excuse for having this happen here. There's no excuse for not knowing enough about this ship that it would go to the point that we would uh, have a uh, you know, travesty like that on our hands. We, we need to get ahead of it, need to find out what's happening. The problem is complicated by the ship's designation as a grave site and by the oil's symbolic meaning. Many visitors and survivors consider the oil to either be the tears of the ship or the, the ship is bleeding. We'll also be dealing with that emotional feelings that people have about the oil and, and the significance. It'll be a balance between what protecting the ecosystem is all about and protecting this, the tomb, the shrine that this place symbolizes. Joining the Park Service on its survey is National Geographic underwater photographer David Dublet. Even though parts of the Arizona were salvaged and the rest is slowly corroding, it is still impressive close up. These huge naval rifles, they could fire something that weighed almost the weight of a Volkswagen 20 miles away. The Arizona, in fact, every battleship was built around these main armaments. We gotta find number 31. There's a clothesman that says 31. Hidden in the oily murk of Pearl Harbor, gun turret number one was forgotten for 40 years. Now, Dubelé is trying to document its massive guns for National Geographic magazine. Almost every problem that I had related to visibility, uh, one footfall, a fin stroke, would kick up this very, very, very soft mud, and the, the clouds would just billow out of the bottom, and the visibility would drop instantly from my wonderful seven feet or five feet down to nothing. The guns are as long as a bus, and bringing enough light down here to photograph them is an arduous operation. Dubelet needs a crew of six people to bring this submerged shrine to life. His moody images recall the ghostly legacy of the Arizona. I think I got the shot. There's a shot of the three main guns of turret number one. And they come out of the they come out of the gloom like three fingers, and I'm looking up at them with a green background in the background. It's very gloomy. It's very dark. And Dan Linehan from the uh, Park Service is down looking and examining the uh, central barrel of the guns. It's a very gloomy, secret picture of the Arizona. To its survivors, the Arizona is much more than a sunken ship. This national park is probably the only one that has the intense emotional reaction that this one does to all visitors. And the survivors have taught me that. I mean, the survivors have really shown me what it is to be an American. And um, I'm probably the strongest American you'd find now <laughs> after having worked here for five years. I think this place can really teach what the price of war is and what the price of freedom is.
Inside the memorial, a wall lists the 1,177 servicemen who died on the battleship. Every returning survivor knew someone who died on December the 7th. They never had a chance. They didn't know what was coming. Nobody knew about it. They never woke up. Aloha. Aloha. Oh, I was going to ask you for a big hug, but I couldn't yeah. get one anyway. Big, big hug. I thought maybe... Big, yeah. big hug. Let me give this lady a hug. I thought maybe that uh, you wouldn't want to hug an ugly old man. Oh, I, I do. I do want to. <laughs> Carl Carson was a 20-year-old sailor on the Arizona the day she went down. He decided to come back yes. to Pearl Harbor when it's, doctors told him emotional. he didn't have much longer to live. Be able to come back. Well, I lost a lot of good, dear friends over there. Just, it's just awful hard to even think about it. I almost lost my own life. I hope, I hope I can make it over there all right. Get there. Yeah. Okay. I need a little support. Carl has never talked very much about what happened to him that day. Now, at last, it's time. This, this is where I came out of turret three. Right. Came back on, on this, there used to be ladders up and down the thing, and I came out the, the turret and went down. On. Well, I was out on deck doing the morning chores. All of a sudden, there's plane come along, and didn't pay much attention to it because planes were landing at Ford Island all the time. And all of a sudden, the chips started flying all around me, and there was a plane that was strafing me. And uh, somebody hollered, it's the damn Japs, get undercover. Bomb went off. I learned later it was back by turret number four, about where I'd been working about 10, 15 minutes before. And evidently, it knocked me out ruptured both my lungs and I got smoke inhalation and all the lights went out. I don't know how long I laid there, but when I woke up, there was no panic down there or anything, but there was smoke and water knee deep. I run into a friend of mine that he was crying and, and asking me for help and I looked at him in horror and the skin on his face and his arms and everything was just hanging off like like a mask or something. And I took a hold of his arm. Skin, skin all came off from my hand. And there was nothing, nothing in this world I could do for that boy. And that had bothered me all of my life. Well, they gave the word to abandon ship. And we just practically stepped off of the quarter deck into the water. And I guess I must have passed out. And went down in the water and everything was just as peaceful and nice. That I, it would have been so easy to just let go. And I saw this bright light. And something made me come to. And so I got back up the surface of the water and, and oil all around. I had water in my oil in my teeth. and down my throat and everything. It tasted horrible, I still taste it today. The oil was a fire all around. The man saw me down there and the fire was approaching me. It wasn't about two feet from me. And he reached down and pulled me up out of the water and that man saved my life. Bob Ballard has spent the entire mission searching the flats outside the harbor without finding any sign of the lost I mean, midget sun. This is only, uh, this is a mile. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to drop you down here at uh, the base. At, at the base, or 
comfortably out. Now he's turning his attention to the steep coral class. escarpment running roughly parallel to the shore, an area he calls the wall. In an expedition like this, uh, you have to put your mind in the mind of the commander of the submarine because his actions are going to define the size of the search area. What he does at that moment is going to uh, tell you how big a search area you have to have. Uh, clearly, if he was killed outright, then you didn't have to put yourself in his mind at all because he's dead, and he's going to be right where they say he sank. But if he's still alive, he's going to then take certain evasive actions, and you have to then say, well, if I were that person, what would I do? And there were two options he had. One was to continue forward into Pearl Harbor, or the other was to turn and run for the high seas. If the midget made a run for the high seas and sank farther out, there's no hope of finding it in the remaining time. But if it had continued toward the harbor, Ballard's team might stand a chance with the help of their own miniature submersible. All right, it's all yours. I'll be uh, talking to you over the room Head north. Turn left. Turn left. The one disadvantage of using a submersible is that Ballard's team won't be able to see what the sub-pilot is seeing during the dive. They'll have to rely on his descriptions over the radio and look at a videotape later. We've uh, landed the sub. It's going to land about uh, 200 meters of water, head due north. As you can see, the airport's right there, so it's going to run into something and it's going to run into a wall and then it's going to head west along that wall uh, because if the submarine hit against that wall, it's going to fall down to the base. So we're going to spend the day exploring the base of this steep scarp that leads right up the channel into Pearl Harbor. To me, uh, deep workers look like sort of manned robots. They've got a human inside of them, but they have this big, you know, this exoskeleton. Uh, but what they do is they, they permit a person to be highly maneuverable. They can spin on their axis, uh, and they can go into very dangerous places because they're so small. In the control room, all anyone can do is listen to the squawk box. Yeah, Mark, give us uh, maybe like 15. I want to try to uh, really nail this guy. Pretty incredibly. They just reported finding a pile of batteries. And this submarine was a lot of batteries. So, starting to look like, smell like, but we're not sure. Then the sub-pilot spots a torpedo. Andy, did he say? Right, where it should get interesting, and it is getting interesting. Uh, he's picked up a torpedo and debris right in the area where we'd expect the uh, submarine to uh, impact it with the wall. Ballard feels they are getting close, but they can't be sure of anything until they retrieve the deep worker and take a look at the videotape. December the 7th, 8.35 a.m., and the beginning of a brief 20-minute lull in the action. At airfields all over the island, crews scrambled to clear the runway so American planes could get in the air. Anti-aircraft guns were made ready. Field hospitals were set up to take care of the wounded, many of them burn victims. The first stories of individual acts of heroism began to make the rounds. One of them was about a mess attendant on the West Virginia named Dory Miller. 
Miller had carried the wounded captain of his ship to safety, then taken up a machine gun and shot down at least two Japanese planes. What made the story remarkable is that Dory Miller had never handled a machine gun, much less trained on one, because he was black, and like all African Americans in the 1941 Navy, restricted to the lowest ranking jobs. Fourteen men received America's highest military award, the Medal of Honor, for their heroism at Pearl Harbor, but Dory Miller wasn't one of them. he got the Navy Cross instead. And the only reason why he didn't get the Congressional Medal because he was black, you know, and the, the Navy being what it was at that time, he only could be a servant to the officers. He never gave any thought for his life or anything. He grabbed a machine gun and he just started blasting away over the side of the ship. What he did was courageous and many of us thought that man should have been given the Congressional Medal of Honor. Two years after Pearl Harbor, Dory Miller died when his ship went down, torpedoed by a Japanese submarine. Pearl Harbor, 8.55 a.m. The seas were still boiling with smoke and flame when the second wave of the Japanese attack struck the island. This time, 167 aircraft split into two main groups. One headed inland. The other hugged the eastern coast and continued south to Pearl Harbor. But this time, the Americans fought back. The smoke in the harbor was now so thick that Japanese pilots had trouble seeing their targets. One of their targets was the battleship Nevada, with a hole in her side steaming toward the channel. Dive bombers honed in on the crippled giant. If they could sink the battleship now, it might block the channel and trap the fleet in the harbor. With all of these planes coming in, when the Nevada got underway, the planes come in, dive bombing that. It looked like bees coming back to the hive. There were so many of them in there at one time that uh, it was amazing that they didn't collide. With bombs falling all around, Nevada's commander was able to run his ship aground on Hospital Point, which kept her from sinking and left the channel clear. By 10 o'clock, it was over. The second wave of attackers headed back to their carriers, leaving behind a shattered Pacific fleet. December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. The United States was at peace with that nation. On the mainland, Americans were stunned by the news they were hearing from Pearl Harbor. Every American alive, over 65 years of age, can remember exactly where they were and what they were doing when they got the news. 
It was a unifying event. It brought us together. Nothing else could have done it in that way. And dastardly attack by Japan on Sunday, December 7th. President Roosevelt addressed the Congress the following day. A state of war has existed between the United States and the Japanese Empire. And by December the 11th, the United States was at war with Germany and Japan, plunging it into a conflict that would forever change its place in the world. Back at Pearl Harbor, one problem survivors faced was notifying people back home that they were okay. The Navy told us that everybody sent a postcard home to your parents, let them know everything's all right. Well, I got one of the last postcards out of there and I sent it home on December the 9th, exactly when I sent it home. And uh, my mother didn't get that postcard until February, the first week of February sometime. I don't know why it took so long, but that's what it did. She didn't know if I was alive or dead. When the mailman got the card at the post office, he closed down the office and ran all the way to my house. He woke my mother and stepfather up at 6 o'clock in the morning and told them, your son's OK, here's a card. Ha, I still have that card. My mom, she couldn't believe it. Uh, I get emotional when I think about it, how she says she she felt. Uh, I just don't know. It just turns me on. Jack McCarran had been married to his high school sweetheart, Roberta, for seven weeks when the attack came. It wasn't until Christmas Day that she found out what had happened to her husband, who was stationed on the Arizona. The Navy Department deeply regrets to inform you that your husband, John Harry McCarran, gunner's mate, second, U.S. Navy, has been reported wounded in action in the performance of his duty and in the service of his country. This was received by me Christmas morning, 7 a.m., December 25th, 1941. Yuck. <laughs> yep, I hate to say this, but in my entire 81 years of living, that was the worst time in my entire life was to have received this telegram because I had no idea whether or not my husband of 49 days <laughs> was alive or dead. Lying in a hospital on Oahu, badly burned, Jack decided to spare his new wife the horror of seeing him again. I said, tell Robert, tell Robert to forget about me and go back to Saugus. So, um, you know, I've been burned and I, I had um, my, I didn't look like me, I guess my face and my hair was only like a, you know, shot. On top of which, it being Christmas, I was 3,000 miles away from my home, 3,000 miles away from my husband. I didn't know anybody. I guess I never did write to you for a oh, No. I didn't write to her for a long time. <laughs> the state of shock I was in was almost as bad as his. But some time passed before I, I probably started coming out of it, and I was aboard ship, and, you know, I love this girl. And uh, I realized that if I was going to survive, it would be with her. My friends and shipmates took me over to uh, the sick bay at Fort Dollar, and they laid me alongside the bulkhead over there, and. And I looked over at another shipmate laying across from me and against the bulkhead, and he was holding his intestines in with his hand. 
And he looked up at me, and he said, it, it sure, war sure is hell, isn't it, shipmate? And I said, yeah, it is. Well, lately I was diagnosed with stomach cancer, and I don't figure I have too many more years to live. And I thought that perhaps I might be a poor spokesman, so to speak, for my shipmates in telling my story so that they wouldn't be forgotten. And that's the one and only reason that I came back. And I'm a kind of a private person. It's been hard to do, but I think it was time that it needed to be told. And uh, I think it has been well worth it. I, I feel a lot better now. It's the final day of the search, and Ballard has had his machines in the water for hours. But he's not hopeful about the outcome. We're uh, in the final throes of this expedition. I mean, today is the last day. We have uh, two subs going in the water right now, but we're, you know, it doesn't look good because we've looked at all the high priority sites and we haven't found the midget submarine. We're now out in the very low priority areas, and that can go on forever because it's a big ocean, so uh, I'd be very surprised if we uh, succeeded today. Deep Worker returns from its pass at the wall and is hoisted out of the water for the final time. With it is a videotape of the debris it encountered. The news isn't encouraging. Uh, we have a possibility, but I, I personally am uh, not overly optimistic. A quick review of the videotape confirms Ballard's fears. On closer examination, what had looked to the subpilot like a pile of batteries turns out to be something else. Looks like any aircraft gun clips or hack hacks or yeah. You know what it looks like to you? And the torpedo the pilot spotted has had its warhead removed, so it can't be from the lost midget sub. You reach a moment when you know you're not going to succeed. Uh, because you've, you've given it the best shot. They're, they're, you're, you're going back over the same territory, seeing the same targets a second or third time. Well, we found a bunch of junk. We don't really have a, a definitive set of objects that says that the submarine broke up, but it could have. So. Clearly, the sub did not survive. And did the ward play a role in its demise? And certainly it did. Uh, but how did it finally meet its end? Gloriously in battle in Pearl Harbor? Was it sunk by someone else later on? What was its final moments? And for now, we don't know what they were. The mystery of what happened to the midget subs would have been even deeper. Had it not been for a surprise development on the morning of December the 8th, 1941. In the early morning hours, a small submarine washed ashore on Oahu's east coast. It was the one piloted by Enzyme Kazuo Sakamaki, the sub with the gyroscope problems. Sakamaki also washed ashore, 
exhausted and delirious. He was captured before he could kill himself and thus became America's first prisoner of war. Of the 10 submariners who set out before dawn on the 7th, Sakamaki was the only one who survived. Historians have generally labeled the submarine mission a failure since only one midget that we know of entered the harbor and was sunk during the attack after firing two harmless torpedoes. But analysis of a photo taken from a Japanese airplane just as the battle began suggests something else. It shows battleship row already under attack, a few minutes after eight, and in the water just beyond, a shadowy shape that appears to be a small submarine and the wake of a torpedo aimed directly at the West Virginia. While some historians remain skeptical, that analysis could explain a message that Dewa received on the night of the 7th, more than 12 hours after the attack. It came from his friend, Ensign Yokoyama. Successful surprise attack. Then silence. Yokoyama's sub never made the rendezvous, and neither did any of the others. For years, Dewa has wondered what happened to Yokoyama and all the others who didn't come back. All he knows is that somewhere in these waters they died, as they expected they would. <laughs> Of course I hoped they would return, but the commander told me, if I come back, I'll come back with a wolf, as we say in Japan, and put the mother sub in danger. So I don't think they planned to return, even if they had succeeded. Before he set out on his mission, one of the submariners left behind a poem he'd written earlier that day. As the cherry blossoms fall at the height of their glory, so too must I fall, that men may call me a flower of Yamato, though my bones lie scattered in the bleak wilderness of strange and distant lands. On the last day of his visit, Dewa asks to see the Arizona Memorial to pay his respects to the Americans who died on December the 7th. America and Japan must have had their reasons for starting a war, but after coming here and seeing the waves of the Pacific, I question why we had to go to war. Japan and the United States are brothers. Pacific peace is world peace. This trip has made me feel that together we must protect it. Jack McCarran and Carl Carson are also there to remember their ship and their shipmates. National Geographic camera prowls through the empty ship. These are the first images of the officers' quarters, images from another era, frozen in time. A bathroom with its regulation soap dish. An officer's desk, its papers still arranged in their pigeonholes. A wash basin, now filled with sand beneath a shaving mirror.
For Jack McCarran, the pictures of his old ship are almost too painful to bear. Over 40 years, over 40 years, I couldn't, if I was asked, I couldn't talk. I didn't talk about it, I didn't think about it. I had erased it from my mind. I didn't have any memories. I really didn't. I saw that barnacles on that doorknob and the, the light in the overhead and the thoughts were, who was that officer down in there? Did he survive? At one time, he, that knob was real nice and shiny and he turned on that light to read. I don't remember the ship as that. The legacy lives on in a Navy ship called the USS Pearl Harbor. For survivors, a journey on this ship is a chance to see the advances that have taken place over the decades. And to participate in some things that never change. Wandering through the galley, Clark Simmons recalls his service in the segregated Navy of 1941. There was only one, one duties open to you, and that was serving the officers. But I've been very impressed with the achievement of the black Americans aboard here, uh, with the, the young ladies. Some of the leading petty officers aboard the ship are black Americans. I don't know the words to put it, how happy I am to see the things that they have done. For veterans like Charles Christensen, this is a chance to pass on the legacy of the battle to a new generation of sailors. Oh, I look at them. I see, I see me when I was 18, when I joined. I was 19 when, when the attack went off. I see it in them. Oh, yeah. I can't even imagine it. I mean, uh, I can't imagine if I would panic or not. I can't imagine seeing my world turned upside down, and my whole world on fire. For three days after the attack, the Arizona continued to burn. The final totals from the surprise attack were staggering. More than 2,400 deaths and almost 1,200 wounded. 21 ships of the US Pacific Fleet had been sunk or damaged, including all eight battleships. Over 300 airplanes have been put out of commission. Admiral Yamamoto had accomplished everything he set out to do, except destroy the American aircraft carriers. And in the fighting to come, that would prove to be a critical failure. One of the best things that ever happened in the United States was our carriers were not involved in the attack. The Yamamoto sank battleships, but the battleship was not the queen of the seas any longer. After that day, from now on, it's the aircraft carrier. And the attack on Pearl Harbor, for all of the losses of lives, which comes first, of course, and the losses of ships, they didn't sink any aircraft carriers. And that made what was already a very bad mistake on Japan's part even worse. 
But perhaps the greatest miscalculation was how the defeat would affect the American fighting spirit. Instead of a crippling blow, it became a rallying cry. And the next morning, the fire was still burning, and there was the ship, some of them, and I'm not for sure that some of them that still had the flag flying from yesterday. And at 8 o'clock, guess what? These ships are sitting there in the mud. It's time to raise the flag, and there's the American flag flying. Everything is fine. And then the Americans went to work. Every ship that had been hit except the Arizona, Utah and Oklahoma was refloated, repaired and put back into service. Many would take part in the battles yet to come. Guadalcanal, Iwo Jima, Okinawa. And so would the men who survived that day. I grew up in the Navy. I learned a lot. When I came out of the Navy, I was six foot even, weighed 200 pounds. I actually grew up. I learned to be, a, we say, a man. When I walk as a Pearl Harbor survivor, especially when I have my uniform on, I walk very proud. I represent the country, and I will represent it to the day I die and I will always be proud to be part of it. Well, Pearl Harbor to me is like beginning a new life. I may be a certain age, but it seemed that I was reborn that day. Pearl Harbor survivors are special. They have a feeling for each other and for their country. They have a comradeship that is not met anywhere in the civilian world. The only people that I've ever met who have that kind of comradeship are foxhole buddies. These guys were in a foxholes together. It's not a feeling of we showed them. It's not a feeling of triumph. It's a feeling of we did it together. We were there. And that's what matters. It's kind of a hallowed place, and it's, uh, it's very beautiful. It, I'm, I'm amazed that it's, it's this beautiful. Now I understand that there's millions of visitors every year that come by and pay their respect to my shipmates. To lots of them, I know a lot of them, they were just names. But to me, they'll always be my shipmates. I don't think we'll ever be done with Pearl Harbor. I think Pearl Harbor is like Gettysburg. It's like Appomattox. It's like Lincoln's assassination. It's like Yorktown and the surrender to General Washington. God help our country if it's ever forgotten.